I've been preaching on and kind of the challenges that I wanted to give to, to Hayden and to all of you, I uh, decided to look at Luke chapter 5, one of my favorite uh, uh, stories of Jesus in the Bible, one of my favorite uh, uh, verses of, of something that he does that is miraculous. And so, uh, but let's, uh, let's turn to Luke chapter 5 and beginning in verse 16 in just a second. But here's what I want you to know. Uh, truth is important. Truth is very important. So we live in a world today where truth is hard to find. Let's just put it that way. We live in a world where truth is hard to find. Uh, as we were recognizing Hayden this morning, as we see him moving from high school on to this next chapter in his life, this next phase in his life, it's important for not only him but for all of us to understand and for all of us to ask the question, what is the truth? What is it that we need to know is the truth? But here's what I want to do this morning. I want to ask you the question, what is truth? But then I want to answer that with another, I want to answer that with another question. What is your mission in life? What is your mission in life? I think if we're going to answer the question, what is truth? I think we need to answer the question of, what is your mission in life? Some people call it this. Some people will say, what is my purpose in life? I'm sure all of you have heard that before. What is my purpose in life? But as I looked up this definition and I looked at what it, meant to, what it said, I would rather us call it a mission. Here's why. A mission is this. A mission is a goal or purpose that is accompanied by a strong conviction. Think about this for a second. It is a mission is something that is accompanied by a strong conviction. That means that you want it. That means that it's important to you. That means that it's something that you have to do if it's a conviction. And so, what is your mission in life? What is this that you're passionate, that you're convicted about? I know a lot of times in our society there are movements and there's causes and there's all these things that people say they're passionate or they're conviction, they have conviction about, but what is it? Sometimes we get caught up in things that are lies that we're passionate about. And then once we get into it, we realize, oh, maybe I put my effort and my time in the wrong place. And so to be able to understand the truth, we must, must also understand our missions in life. But unfortunately, for many of us, a lot of times our missions aren't there. Our mission in life isn't there. Christians are floundering. They're not looking for what they can do. They figure as long as they're at church on a Sunday morning that their mission in life is being accomplished. So I want to start with a story that a dad tells about his son and his daughter, a football game and cheerleading. How's that sound? Sounds like a good uh, southern football story, right? But here's a, da a dad telling this story. He says, yesterday, my son, who is six years old, he grabs my daughter, Annie, and says, Hey, get your pom-poms. I want you to come in the backyard with me. I'm going to play some football, and I want you to be my cheerleader. She's like, Okay. And the dad says, Well, I'm like, Okay, well, she can play football too. And be honest with you, she'd probably rip your head off, but that's all right. You go get your pom-poms, and you cheer. And so the daughter and the son went out, and he says, I looked out in the backyard, and he says, there's Annie with her pink pom-poms. She's got on a tutu, and she's cheering for her brother, and she's like, go, Bubba, go, Bubba, go. And he's throwing the football, get, he's diving, he's catching, he's rolling at 10 yards into the end zone. And he stands up, he spikes the, bu the, the ball, and he, he says, it's good, and she's cheering, and she's yelling, and she's doing all this stuff. And then they come inside. And she comes inside, and she says, hey, Dad, did you see me and Bubba playing football? And then the dad said something that he regretted for the rest of his life. He said, sweetie, I saw your brother playing football, but I just saw you cheering. And he said, in the story, he says, I got this look that I've never seen on her face before and one that I'll never forget before. But he said it was the truth. He was playing football and all she was doing was standing on the sideline cheering. She was just cheering on someone who was playing. And a lot of times in our churches, it seems like that's what we're doing, is we're just the cheerleaders for those that are doing the mission of God. And don't get me wrong. I've talked about this. I've preached on this before. Sometimes that's our duty is to be the cheerleaders for others at times. We're to cheer others on. But then at times, God wants us to get up, and he wants us to get in the game as well. 
And so today, I want us to look at a mission that Luke tells us about. I want us to look at a mission that Luke tells us about for these men. They had one goal, and they had a mission in life, and they would do anything to succeed that. So I want us to look at that today, and I want us to think about our own lives and what we're doing to succeed in the missions that we have. So Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed, brought on a, bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and led him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up, and he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So here's the story. I love this story. As we go through this story, we see these men, they were determined to help their friend. But the question that I want to ask you this morning, the question is this, is what is important in your life? We saw what was important to these men, but the question for you today is what's important for you? What is important for you? For someone like Hayden that just graduated high school, the last 18 years of his life or the last uh, years, the 12 years he was in school there, his goal has been to graduate at some point. His, his life goal was to do that. That was what was important to him. He was an e Eagle Scout. That was important for him to come through and, and to make sure that those things are done. But now, after graduating high school, what is important? What is it that is important to you? For you, in life, every day, what is important to you? What is the most important thing to you? Now, I know we kind of make fun of these things. You, you see these, uh, these uh, thing, videos on social media, these memes and things. You see uh, people at beauty pageants, uh, and they say, what, what is it you would like to have in life, or what's the most important thing? And what's the answer? Peace. Yeah, see, y'all have seen the same ones I've seen. It's always peace. We want peace in the world. That's what we want. We want peace. That's always the most important thing. But I ask you this morning, is peace really the most important thing? Some of you might say the most important thing in life is fighting hunger or my family or human rights or stopping all the wars or whatever it may be. It goes on and on and on about the most important thing in life. But really, when it gets down to it, what is the greatest need in the world today? Salvation. Somebody's already talking for me. <laughs> No, salvation. The greatest need in the world today is salvation through Jesus Christ. That is the greatest need. There is no other greater need in the world today. If you don't hear anything else, believe this. The greatest need in this world today is Jesus Christ. Salvation through Jesus Christ. Because if you don't have salvation through Jesus Christ, nothing else in this world is going to matter to you. Okay? Salvation through Jesus Christ is the most important thing in the world today. And the most important mission in your life is to lead people to Jesus for salvation. That is your most important mission in life. You see, these men, they had a mission. They had a friend that couldn't walk. He was paralytic. They had a friend that couldn't walk through there. And so they had one mission. And that mission was to get that friend to Jesus Christ. Because they knew that nothing else was important in this world came other than getting their friend to Jesus Christ. Their mission was to get him to Jesus. Now, they didn't know what was going to happen. They knew that Jesus was healing people. And so they were expecting Jesus to do something with their friend. But they had no idea what was about to happen. But their mission in life, their mission was to get their friend to Jesus Christ. And here's the thing about their mission. Their mission should be our mission in life. 
Their mission should be ours. And their mission was to get people to Jesus. Our mission should be, get, should be to get people to Jesus. But here's the problem. We will face opposition when we do this. If you and I try to get people to Jesus Christ, we will face opposition. The Pharisees were there. The teachers of the laws were there. They were there, and they didn't agree with Jesus. They would come and listen to him preach so they could ridicule and confront him. He was te his teaching was telling people to go away from what they were being taught by the Pharisees and to go toward God and toward the kingdom of heaven and toward Jesus Christ. And they didn't like that. They didn't like that. And I believe that's the same today. I believe one reason we have so much hatred in our world is because people don't want to hear the message of Jesus anymore. They're angry when they hear the message of Jesus. They get upset. It used to be that in our world we had this word called tolerance in our world. What did tolerance mean at one point? At one point, tolerance meant that you could disagree with someone and still get along with them. But in today's world, that's not the case. In today's world, it's you agree with me or I hate you or you hate me. That's what they say. And so there's going to be opposition. And here's the number one reason there's opposition. People don't want to hear the truth. People do not want to hear the truth. Let me, let me add on to that. People don't want to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me back up and add on. People don't want to hear the truth of Jesus this is one of the biggest causes of opposition in our world today. People hear God's truth and it interferes with their life and they want to get rid of it. People don't want to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. This is what was happening with the Pharisees. They were like, blasphemy, you're not speaking God's word. You're not doing what we want you to do, in other words. And so there's opposition in our lives. These men that were bringing their friend to Jesus Christ, they faced more than one opposition. There were crowds that would not let the men feel, see Jesus. They would not let them in. There were too, too many people around, and they couldn't get through the crowd. Our life feels like that sometimes. Imagine the crowd being our life, and there's too much of us. There's too many things in our life, and because there's so many things in our lives, we can't get to Jesus Christ. Our schedules are too busy. Our, our kids are keeping us too busy. Our, our TV is keeping us too busy. My phone, my social media, my life, everything in it, it all crowds Jesus out, and I can't get to Jesus Christ. And so it keeps us away from Him. And so the opposition, number one, we got to come up with is we got we to get rid of the things in our life before we can help people. we got to get through that opposition. But what do we do? What do we do when everything around us seems to keep us away from Jesus Christ? We have to be like these men, and we have to remember the mission, and we have to keep it going. We have to remember the mission, and we have to keep it going. Remember, the mission is this. The mission is to get people to Jesus Christ. So, think about this for a second. I know normally I don't have y'all say anything in the morning service. I just let y'all kind of sit there. But today, we're going to be a little interactive. I promise nobody has to stand up, okay? Nobody has to do anything. But this morning, listen, I want you to understand this. What was the mission of the men in these verses? What was their mission? What was their mission? All right, I'm going to give you the answer, and then I want y'all to repeat it back to me, okay? Y'all think y'all can do this? We're, we're practicing for vacation Bible school. Just pretend it's that. All right, their mission was to help one man. All right, y'all ready? What was their mission? To help one man, okay? Their mission wasn't to save the entire city. Their mission wasn't to save the entire world. Their mission was to do what? One man. All right, so y'all did good. Y'all passed this morning. Help one man, though. Their mission was to help one man. Not a whole village, not a community, but one man. Can you imagine in our world today if we said our entire church is going to try to help one person get to heaven? You know what would happen? And I'm sorry if this hurts, but here's what would happen. Somebody would say, that's a waste of resources for an entire church to try to get one person to heaven. I've heard it. I've seen it. Other churches see and hear it. We can't spend that much time to get one person to heaven. Why not? Why not? Their mission, 
God's mission is to help one person. Too many people trying to help one person is a bad thing. Wrong. It's a lie. The truth is this. God wants us to do all we can to get one person at a time into heaven through Jesus Christ. They knew, these men knew the importance of the mission. They knew what it should be. And so they were taking him to Jesus Christ no matter what. You've all heard the saying before, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, we're going to change that. It takes a church to get one person to Jesus Christ. If everyone in this room had one mission and it was all the same person, God would bless that because he wants to see us do all we can to get one man, one lady, one child to Jesus Christ. So why would they spend all of their time, all of their effort to get one friend that's been paralyzed all this time to Jesus Christ? Because they realized it was their mission. They realized it was their mission. They realized that their mission was to help this man get to Jesus Christ. And what I want you to realize today is this. It is your mission. Your mission done with conviction and with purpose is to help others find Jesus. Now, we do that in different ways. We do that in different ways. But the main goal is to help others find Jesus Christ in life. That should be our mission. And then the question becomes this. How will your, how will your missions define you? Remember when I asked you at the very beginning what your purpose in life was or what your mission in life is? What will, you, what will define you? What will be the driving force that people will remember you by? What will be the thing in your life that people will look back and say, that was their mission? Our missions in life will define us. And when they define us, that is what people are going to remember us by. Their driving force, their mission in life was this. Get that person to Jesus Christ no matter what it takes. Why? Because they believed that Jesus could help their friend. They believed that Jesus would help their friend. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that that person you know that's struggling with whatever it may be, it could be sin, it could be addiction, it could be whatever, do you believe that Jesus is the hope for them? Do you believe that today? And is your mission to show people that Jesus Christ is the only hope? I honestly believe this today. If we truly believed Jesus was the hope for the world, we would do more to get people to him. Think about this statement. If we believe Jesus was the hope for the world, we would do more to get people to him. Okay? All right. If I came in here today and I told you that I just heard an article and there was a cure for whatever disease was ailing your friend, but you had to go through a bunch of hoops to get it, what would you do for your friend or your family? You'd do everything you could to get that cure for them. What I'm telling you today is this. If we truly believe that the only hope for our friends and family from the disaster and destruction of hell and eternity was Jesus Christ, then we would be doing a whole lot more to go tell them about him. Because I'm telling you this right here this morning. Our mission in life is to take people to Jesus, not for our satisfaction, but for their eternity, for their soul. Because without Jesus Christ, there is no hope for their souls. And they believe that. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that there is no other hope? And then they did something that was great. They did something that was great. They didn't stop because of obstacles that were in their way. I love this part. This is probably one of the reasons I love this, this, this whole story here. Is here's what they saw. They were walking down the street. We don't know how many men there were. They were walking down the street. They were carrying this makeshift uh, 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 stretcher light thing for their friend on it. Maybe this mat they were carrying him behind or whatever it may be. There was a crowd of people. They walk around the corner and there's a crowd of people there and they couldn't get through. Imagine some some big sporting event or some parade you've been to and you're trying to get through and you're trying to get through the crowd of people. They couldn't get through there. Then not only was there a crowd of people there, then there were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders that stood there 
all puffed up with all their garments on, looking down on everybody else, saying, we get the front line, we get the front row of Jesus, nobody else can have it. They were sitting there. The door was blocked. They couldn't get in. They couldn't do anything. All hope was lost. All hope was lost. But they didn't give up. Now, I don't know which one of them had this idea, but he's my, he's my man. He's my man. One of them said, hey, let's take him up to the roof and let him down in through the house in front of Jesus. All of us have the one friend that would come up with that, right? All of us have that one friend that would do that. That's the kind of friend you want, though. You want that friend that says, I'm not going to let the obstacles get in the way. I'm not going to let anything stop me. I'm going to get you to Jesus Christ no matter what it takes. And that friend said, he looked at the others and he said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take him up on the roof. We're going to lower him down right in front of Jesus. And he's not going to have any choice but to see. Okay? You know why they did that? They did that because they had a passion for the mission. They had a passion for the mission. They had a passion to get Jesus Christ there. I mean, imagine it. Here it is. Here are all these people. They can't get around. They can't get to the front door. So they take him up on the roof and let him down through the house. That is passion for the mission. That is passion for the mission. Here we are. We're trying to tell people about Jesus Christ. And if we trip over a rock or we stomp our toe or we do something, we get the least little obstacle in our lives and we say, oh, I can't go tell anybody about Jesus today. I can't do it. These men saw the obstacle. They took him up on top of the house. I don't know how the house was made, but most of those houses in uh, Israel and in that area of the country, what they do is they have flat roofs, and then they actually have a place up on the, on the roof where they can go and they can eat and they can do things. So I don't think there was a hole in the middle of the roof. There may have been, but what, here's what we do know. We do know somehow they got him on the roof, and they started lowering him down through the roof to see Jesus Christ. Why? Because they had a passion for the mission to get people to Jesus Christ. Nothing was going to keep them from their mission, and nothing should keep us from our mission of telling others about Jesus. So, here's this man on a stretcher, whatever you want to call it. Here's Jesus standing there talking to a crowd of people, and all of a sudden, some commotion starts happening above Jesus. And he's this commotion's happening. Jesus looks up. He already knows what's going on, okay? Jesus already knows what's happening. He looks up. I, I imagine, this is my opinion, but I imagine he has a little smile on his face because he knows what's getting ready to happen. He looks up, and these, this man's being dropped from the ceiling with some rope. And you know the crowd, the Pharisees, they're just like, rah, 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 rah. you know, they're, they're having a fit. And here's this man sitting here. And the friends are smiling, going, they're giving each other high fives. Jesus is looking at this man. The man's looking up at Jesus. We don't know what he's thinking. He's probably thinking his, his friends have lost their mind at this point. Yeah, he's scared. And here's what we're seeing. We're seeing this. But you know what? Jesus stops. He stops what he's doing. He looks at this man with compassion. He looks at him, and he looks up at his friends, and he's smiling. And he looks at this man, and he's thinking in his head, what is my mission? That's what Jesus is thinking. What is my mission? And you know what, the Christ, what Jesus Christ's mission was? Jesus Christ's mission was to seek and save that which was lost. His mission in life was to seek and save that which was lost. That's from Luke 19.10, if you want the Bible verse to go with that. His mission was to seek and save that which was lost, Luke 19, 10. So here's Jesus. He sees this man sitting in front of him. He's thinking in his mind, what is my mission? My mission is to seek and save that which is lost. So what does he do? He looks at the man, and he doesn't say, get up and walk. He doesn't say, you're healed. He doesn't say, why are you here? He doesn't say, you guys get this guy out of here because I don't have time for him. He doesn't do any of those things. He looks at this man. He has compassion in his eyes. And he looks at him and he says, your sins are forgiven. And the crowd just goes, what? The Pharisees started yelling and screaming. 
the Pharisees started going, what do you mean you forgive him of his sins? What do you mean that's blasphemy? You can't forgive him of his sins. Only God can. And I know Jesus probably wanted to say, there you go, you got it. I am, I am God's son. But he didn't. He looked at them and they said, you can't do that. You can't do that. And Jesus was thinking, this was my mission. My mission is to seek and save those which is lost. It is not to heal the sick. My mission is not to help those that are lame to walk, those that are blind to see, those that are deaf to hear. That wasn't Jesus' mission. He did all those things, but that wasn't his mission. His mission was to seek those that were dying and going to hell in their sins and saving them. That was his mission. And he looked at this man and he said, your sins are forgiven. It doesn't matter if you can't walk. It doesn't matter if you can walk or run. What matters in life is your soul. And that's what Jesus understood. And Jesus said, he said, I could have easily healed him, but his soul is more important than his legs. His soul is more important than him being able to walk. And the Pharisees didn't know what to do. They were just all up in arms. And so Jesus looked at them and he said, okay, if it'll make you happy. And he looked at the man and he said, get up and walk, you're healed. But you know what he showed us in that one little scene? He shows us this. He shows us that our souls are more important than our physical bodies. And we forget that. We forget that all the time. We forget that someone's soul is the most important thing about them. And we need to make that our mission. Our mission should be about people's souls and not about the people themselves. Does that make sense? It should be about their souls. Jesus looked at this man, and he didn't, he didn't heal him at the beginning. He said, your sins are forgiven. So I ask you again, what is your mission? What is your mission today? What drives you? What pushes you? What moves you forward in life? Maybe your goal at one point in life was to have a good job. You check that off. Maybe your goal was to have a family, and you've checked that off. Maybe now you're working on early retirement. Maybe you're looking to leave a good inheritance to your children. What is your mission? What is your goal? Now, don't get me wrong. All these things are good, but I believe the Bible is telling us our mission and our goal should be more than providing for ourselves and for our family. It should be seeking those that are lost and taking them to Jesus Christ. We should be like these men that lowered their friend down through the roof, and we should say our goal in life is to get one person at a time to Jesus. One person at a time to Jesus is what we should do. What things in your life are keeping you from doing that? What things in your life do you need to move? What obstacles do you need to move so that you can reach people for eternity? Everybody in this room has the same mission. Now, God will give you different paths to accomplish that mission, but we all have the same mission. And that mission is to, first of all, ourselves know Jesus Christ, ask him to forgive us of our sins, and then for us to tell others about him. So maybe you're here today and you're going, well, I'm just not for sure what it means. Maybe you're like the man being lifted or dropped down through the ceiling and you're, you're just in trouble and you're going, I need, I need help. The only help we have in this world is Jesus Christ because it is only He that can forgive us of our sins. And let me assure you this morning, He wants to do with you what He did with this man. He wants to meet you and He wants to help you. I love the fact that this man, these men dropped this guy in front of Jesus and He didn't chastise them. He didn't say, you interrupted my sermon. He didn't say, look, i got to be out of here by 12 o'clock, people. You know, He didn't say any of those things. He said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus wants to meet you. Jesus wants to be a part of your life. He wants to do the same thing for all of us today that he did for this man. And he wants to look at us and he wants to say, your sins are forgiven. But then he also wants, to do, wants us to do what those friends did. He wants us to be a part of his mission. He wants us to be a part of his mission to give, to seek others, and lead them to Jesus Christ. You see, his mission was so important that he gave his life for it. Now, I ask you, what are we willing to give up to help Jesus Christ in the mission that he's given us? 
You see, many of us come here today for different reasons. But we all should be so that we can get closer to Jesus and help accomplish that mission today. Is there a crowd in front of you? Are you, are you paralyzed? Is your health bad? What is keeping you from Jesus Christ today? Because understand this. The only way we're going to accomplish this mission is through him and his help. The only way we can do it is through him. So as we close out this morning, I ask you this. What's your mission? What are you willing to do to change your mission in life from whatever it may be now to say, I'm going to help others find Jesus? That is the mission we need to have as individuals and as a church. If this morning you don't know Jesus Christ and you're, you're like this man, you're going, I need this forgiveness myself. I need to know what it means to have my sins forgiven. Seek him. He's the only one that can do it. I'd be more than happy to show you that path and lead you to that path, but only Jesus can remove those sins. If you're here this morning saying, Pastor, I've done that already, but I don't know how to get started on this mission, it's the same answer. Seek Jesus. Let him take you, walk you down that path to that mission. Let him walk you down and lead you to that mission. Let him open your eyes and let him show you who that person is that he wants you to reach out and seek and who you should be reaching for. So today, I pray this. I pray that whatever your goal and mission in life was when you walked in, I honestly pray that's a little different when you walk out today because I pray now that your mission is to help others find Jesus Christ. We can do all the other things that we need to do in our lives. But we need to make that our mission and our goal. Help others find Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this morning. Lord, just to see the passion that these men had to bring their friend to you, Lord. Father, I pray that you will help us understand that to help one person is what you called us to do. Lord, to go out and, and lead others to you, one person at a time. Help us. Father, I know that all of us here today have things that get in our way, Lord. We have things in our lives, Lord, where we have jobs and schedules and all these things that just seem to keep us away from you. So, Father, I pray this morning that you will help us turn those over to you, Lord, and that you will help us see how we can still focus on you, how we can use the things that you've given us in our lives to help others find you. Father, I pray for those that may be here this morning that have never come to you for that salvation of sin, from their sins, Lord. They have never sought you, Lord, to be forgiven for their sins. Lord, I pray this morning that you will show others. Lord, show those who haven't done that, Lord, what it means to have sin and what it means to be free from those sins through Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us relay that message to others today. But Father, I pray that we will be changed because of you when we leave today. Father, this man that came down from the ceiling, whenever he met you, he was changed beyond measure. His sins were forgiven and he was able to walk and do things he had never done in his life after meeting you. Help us to be that way this morning as we leave. Help us, because of what you do in our lives, to be different than we were when we